Welcome to RetroCore 16 and kicking off this show we've got Arcus Odyssey for the Sharp X68000. We've got a shitload of stuff coming up for you in today's show, such as uh, we've got Share of the Month of course, we've got Game of the Month, and we've got loads of great stuff as well. But I'm not going to tell you what it is because I'm a miserable mean bastard, so you're going to have to sit down and watch the show to find out. Okay, so here we are with Arcus Odyssey, and you've got a choice of uh, four characters to choose from there. Of course you've got to go the elf, the female elf. This game is also featured on the Sega Mega Drive, but the Mega Drive version certainly doesn't have this high resolution intro on it. And actually the main intro at the beginning is a lot longer as well on the Sharp version. Oh yeah, by the way it's also on the Super Famicom, or the NES, or SNES I should say. Yeah, again that doesn't feature the intro, so it looks like the Sharp's winning there, here. Okay, definitely uh, the elf's one of my favourite characters because she has this little uh, bow and arrow here which you can rebound off all the obstacles, making her life a hell of a lot easier. Ops Odyssey is a sort of an uh, action RPG, if you will. Not an RPG in the traditional style, mind you. Basically, for example, on uh, this level, you got a uh, find your way through the maze and uh, pick up little uh, items on the way from treasure chests and basically find your exit and kill the bad guy. Pretty simple really. Well, should be really because it's uh, only the first level. But, you know, we've got to watch out for those big toads. You know, they got a tongue that shuts down a mile. I wonder what they're after. Perfectly it ain't too hot, uh, but they, you know, they serve the purpose. In fact, it does look better than the Mega Drive and the uh, Super Famicom versions, but um, you know, that's not saying much. But as you come to expect from a uh, Shop X68000 and uh, using a uh, Wolf Team as well, it's got really, really good audio. In fact, the uh, Wolf Team do actually uh, produce some pretty good sounds, not only on the Shop, but also the Mega Drive. There we go, just uh, kill the big bad guy there. And off to the second level. So as you can see here we've got to uh, save a couple of prisoners and one of these prisoners uh, will uh, join us on our quest which is very welcome because uh, this level is quite ch tough Items that you pick up throughout the game you can actually use and, uh, to aid you in your quest, such as um, the revamp um, your energy supply, or you can use them uh, as uh, projectiles, whatever. There are a couple of bombs and magics as well. Also, your uh, character does have a shield, which is uh, activated by holding down the uh, fire button. So while Arcus Odyssey doesn't look much cop, 
It actually is a very, very good game. It's uh, sort of like um, Axis FZ or Final Zone as it's known in the West, and Granada X, or Granada I should say. Um, both of those games don't look uh, much copy either, but they're both excellent shooters. And uh, Arx Odyssey does fall into the same category. So if you've got a Mega Drive, a Super Famicom, SNES, or a Sharp X68000, you lucky bastards, then I seriously recommend uh, picking up this game. You know, you might not like it at first, but um, I can assure you, the more you play it, the more you get into it, the more you're going to like it. It's just one of those games that definitely grow on you. Look at that, I got my sword now. So Let's go, is very happy to give Arkstar to see the lovely score of... 7 out of 10, not a bad game. Shutoko Battle 2 Better known as Tokyo Extreme Racer Or whatever name it was given in the West And as you no doubt guessed, this is um, the sequel to the uh, first game Which also appeared on the Sega Dreamcast Now as the first game was a two player game, this uh, sequel is only actually a one player game But Even though it does sacrifice the two player option It does improve a hell of a lot on the graphics Which you're about to see uh, modes of play are plenty, and you can also buy all sorts of extras for your car, you can uh, soup up every option available on your car. You can even buy body parts, uh, aerodynamic parts, uh, even paint in different colours. And you can even uh, design your very own logo, which you can uh, paste to the back of your car and on the side and also on the bonnet as well. It's a very nice little feature. As you can see here, we're racing down the streets of Tokyo. Graphics are absolutely stunning. Now, the idea of the game is to find a um, rival. Something you do is you flash your headlights at the rival, and then, then they'll accept your challenge, and you've got to beat them in a race. Beat them in a race, you win money. Use that money to buy extras for your car. Basically, that's all there is to it. So as you can see we're bombing it down the tunnel here. The use of the rear view mirror in the game is essential because the computer controlled cars or the computer AI I should say is completely rock hard on later level sands and they try all sorts of sneaky tricks to get past you. So basically you've got to get in front of them. After each battle you can get a little replay as you can see. Now why Shudoku Battle 2 does look a masterpiece and it does sound pretty good as well even though I prefer the music in the first game. It's not without its problems, um, it does actually suffer from slowdown. Which is uh, quite a shame, in fact it was one of the main reasons why uh, people went out and started over clocking their uh, Sega Dreamcasts. The slowdown is most apparent in replays to be honest, so it's not too bad. But uh, it does actually happen a little bit when you're actually playing the game as well. But the slowdown is not that severe that it does um, take away the enjoyment of the game. I just wish that there was an actual uh, two player option available. Control wise, the cars do control very twitchy at first. But once you actually learn about your car and you've figured out how to customize your car, you can actually adjust the controls to the way you like them. Which can uh, result in either your car controlling like completely not to shit if you don't know how to uh, customize it properly, or controlling like a complete dream, which my uh, Lancer Evolution is controlling like right now. So 
So overall Stoker Battle 2 is definitely one game that must belong to your collection. A very good fine tuned racer. Unfortunately after this game the series sort of went downhill. Looks like Genki just took uh, granted the, the power to the PlayStation's graphical capabilities and uh, forgot all about the gameplay. They should have stuck with Sega. Swift Mikami for the uh, Super Famicom here. One of my personal favourites from uh, my younger days. Stars, uh, of course, Miss Ghost Ripper Mikami. And um, basically, as you probably guess, she's an exorcist of some sort. And she walks around the cities of uh, Tokyo getting rid of all the ghosts. More of a, like a sort of a modern day anime Ghostbuster, I guess. Which is actually, wasn't it? Anyway, the game starts off with uh, the little introduction that you just saw there. As you haven't guessed, uh, it's based on the anime and the manga of the same name, which is actually are pretty funny as well. So straight away, you'll notice the game looks absolutely beautiful. Those little nice touches, such as the little um, towel or whatever it is hanging off the little platform just there, was waving in the wind. With the zombies smashing out the windows, you can get the nice little sound effects as well. So yeah. Straight away, graphically, you can see it's a nice uh, feast for the eyes. Audio wise, you got some nice uh, little speech effects when uh, Mikami gets hit, and you got some pretty good, decent uh, thumping music as well. Don't know if it's actually uh, suiting to the game, but I like it. Some Mikami can do a various uh, amount of moves. She can uh, 
slush up with the sword which brings it down in sort of a down motion uh, she can also uh, just hit it out straight forward and then um, if she picks up certain icons she can actually uh, fire out different projectiles as well see at the moment I've got a lightning rod a the cheek can there trying to feel uh, Kami's myth boss time. So when you come to meet a boss, the Kami has a little chat with them, as you do. Bosses throughout the game are pretty easy, um, once you learn the pattern of them. This first level boss is actually piss easy, all you do is avoid his hands and that's it. Just takes a couple of minutes to kill, that's all. Oop. Thanks to the powers of magic dodgy head thing. You'll be dead in no time. I forgot to mention that uh, Mikami also has a magic which she can throw out, which um, basically just destroys everything on screen at once. Bit of a smart bomb, really. So once you kill the boss, you collect your little crystal. The aim of the game is to collect all the crystals which fit into this statue just here, as you can see. So when you complete a level you get a little cutscene as well, which explains the story and uh, what's going to happen in the next scene. GS Mikami might not look much by watching this video, it is actually a very fun game and it is quite a challenge as well. Uh, one thing that does piss me off however is that if you get like a special weapon for your uh, sword, um, as soon as you get hit once that special power disappears so uh, you're back down to your standard uh, sword again, which is a bit of a shitter. But apart from that, I think the game is absolutely uh, spot on. You know, it's pretty, sounds good and um, plays really well. So Retro Club is very happy to give JS McCammy on the Super Famicom a lovely score of 7 out of 10. Not bad at all. I think we better not continue. Check out that funky soundtrack. 
This is Gremlins for the Super Famicom. Uh, it's not Super Famicom, sorry, for the Famicom. For Nintendo. Well, Sunsoft have really done an excellent job on the audio on this game, and even graphically it looks pretty good as well. Pretty hard to believe it's a Nintendo. So the game has us uh, taking the place of our little friend Gizmo here, armed with a load of tomatoes, out to uh, regain the uh, powers of the um, office office block. Throughout the game, you can go and visit your little Chinese uh, master here and uh, buy some little power ups. Get lights on my ball here as a balloon. So basically, when I die, um, I can use the balloon to uh, warp to another part of the level, which is very handy for uh, avoiding those nasty jumps. Gizmo's uh, available. Uh, very Gizmo can uh, jump and uh, fire out little projectiles, but that's about it really. But that's all he really needs to do, because he, you know, he's Gizmo, isn't he? Sometimes uh, some of the traps and uh, positions of enemies can be extremely awkward to get past. But uh, it does add to that challenge, and you do actually have to think out your route throughout the game. You can't just uh, sort of dive in there and jump all over the place. Well, you're going to end up falling down a bloody hole or getting knocked down a hole by uh, some little bastard enemy. So it is one of the more tougher uh, platformers out there, and as you can see I've just been killed. Plot wise it doesn't really follow the movie that well, but uh, I suppose not many uh, licensed games do follow the uh, original license that well. Even if it didn't have uh, Gremlins as many characters, I'd still say this would be one uh, pretty good addictive game. If not, a little bit too difficult. So that's your code. Going and give a uh, Gremlins on the uh, Famicom a lovely score of 7 out of 10. I only let down by the fact that it can be a little bit too tough at times, and uh, because of that toughness, it does really piss you off to be honest. As you can see here, I just keep getting killed constantly. There you go, down the hole. Hey, if you have your challenge, pick it up.
The Art of Fighting 2. Disgusting how much money I spent on this game in the arcades. Yeah, back then the absolutely giant sized sprites and the zooming in and out screen were like the latest thing. Absolutely gobsmack and stuff back in its day. And even to this day, you know, the size of the sprites is still quite impressive. I think from Art of Fighting, or Art of Fighting 2, it's when SNK actually started getting good at making their 2D beatmaps. Because you gotta admit, the very first Fatal Fury was a sack of shit. And the first Art of Fighting was a bit on the crap side as well. But it did have that excellent porno voice acting. Well, it did if you played that in English anyway. Like all Neo Geo games, or practically all Neo Geo games, Art of Fighting 2 has the uh, option to view it in Japanese or English. Of course, we're playing it in the Japanese version. Because in the Japanese version, you get lots of lovely uh, little touches, such as the blood and bruises. So the more you beat the crap out of your uh, opponents, the more bruised his face looks. As you can see here, John's face is looking pretty nasty. One thing that I really love about art fighting is the sound effects used in it. The actual uh, connecting sounds, so when you punch people or kick people, it has this really big beefy echo to it, which really gives you the feel of, uh, you know, hitting them hard. It actually goes quite well with the size of the sprites as well. It sort of fits together. Definitely some of the best punching and kicking sound effects ever used in a beat em up. Newcomers to art of fighting might find the game a bit claustrophobic. Um, Sometimes, you know, when you got the two big characters standing next to each other on the screen, it does look a bit on the uh, small side, you know, the actual fighting area, which actually can be a problem, because you can't do your bloody fireballs and whatever. But, again, that could be a good point, because uh, it's not the worst of a cheating bastard sent in the corner throwing a shitload of fireballs at you. Throughout the game you get these little bonus sections, I think there's two or three in total, actually I think there's only two. And um, if you complete the bonus section you actually get to uh, perform an extra special move. See at the moment we're trying to do um, the initial super death blow as they call it in English. And I'm using a control pad and I'm uh, failing miserably. But anyway, if you do manage to pull off six of these you actually can use it within your actual fights. Which is really useful because it takes probably three quarters of the enemy's energy off. As you can see below uh, the energy bar you've got a special move energy bar. You can charge this up by holding down two buttons and um, you can actually drain your opponent's energy bar by uh, taunting them. Once your green energy bar has gone uh, you can't actually do any special moves. Which can be a bit of a pain in the ass but it does add that little bit of a twist to the game. Unfortunately, the uh, CPU seems to be able to power up their energy bar a lot quicker than what the uh, player can. Which brings me to uh, another thing about Art of Fighting. It's too fucking hard for its own good. You've really got to master all the characters, or at least one character, to figure out how to beat the opponents. The game is incredibly tough and sometimes to be fair, unbalanced. You know, the computer can throw you quite a lot and like a throw takes off half your energy. Fucking eight throws. But overall, Art Fighting 2 on the Neo Geo isn't that bad. You know, it's a fun game. Don't be expecting like the major beat em ups, such as uh, Fatal Fury Special, to be uh, compared to this because they, they're just far above this one. But still, if you have to have uh, a fun beat em up with a difference, Art Fighting is well worth uh, checking out. Retro Core score of 7 out of 10. This month's Whatever Happened 2 comes to us from Bandai. This is Millennium Fire for the Sega Saturn, in production for absolutely ages and never did see the light of day.
basically it's uh, just a adventure game set in space where you use your saves and light gun to uh, actually move yourself around and to blow the shit out of all the enemies. New Zealand story here for the Sega Master System. Just listen to that music. Giddy as hell, that is. Okay, so as you can see, it looks absolutely marvelous. Bit of a weird way to say that, isn't it? Marvelous. Anyway, the game looks absolutely amazing. As you can see, I just got killed straight away. And the game is actually running uh, pretty fast because this is a PAL version, and because uh, I don't have a PAL machine, I have to run it in uh, NTSC. And um, unfortunately it runs a lot faster than uh, it should be. But at least it gives you an idea how the game looks. Unfortunately the Master System version of um, New Zealand Story does seem to be a bit on the uh, dodgy collision detection side. And that could be just because it's running a bit too fast and I can't really uh, tell whether I'm uh, getting hit or not. But um, there does seem to be something not quite right about it. But then again, like I said, that could be down to the fact that I'm playing it in uh, the wrong girl settings. But uh, graphically wise, it's uh, pretty much all there. Of course, there are a few things missing and things are toned down a little bit. But the actual main game does look pretty faithful to the arcade. It's very, very colourful. And uh, the sprites are well defined. Uh, sound wise, uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Decent enough uh, representation of the original sound there. Controls are tight enough, I guess. In fact, for the mass system, this game is very, very impressive looking. Definitely one of the uh, more impressive uh, Apex games I've seen out there. Actually produced by uh, the now defunct Tech Magic as well. So they did a very, very good job on this one. So I'm actually, of course, very happy to give um, New Zealand Story on the Master System and Esco a very out of 10. I just hope that it plays a lot uh, smoother in a PAL version, otherwise, the 8 out of 10 will have to get knocked down to 6 out of 10. But I'm sure it does play a lot better when you're playing on the right machine. Game of the Month, Fancy Star Online version 2. The very first console MMORPG. That's a massively multiplayer online role playing game. Or at least I think that's what it means. Yeah, Fancy Star Online, 
was well ahead of its time and it was respected by fucking thousands of people. Made by Sonic Team for the Dreamcast. This game basically wasn't anything to do with a fancy star, the uh, traditional Mega Drive role plays, or not that I could see anyway. Well, there was a few links there, but uh, the majority of the game <laughs> wasn't based on uh, the actual Fancy Star series. Basically, um, all you had to do was uh, go on different quests for different worlds to choose from, and um, basically complete the tasks at hand. In the one player game, playing offline, which you can see now, it was fairly good, fun, but uh, it did get a bit lonely on the quests. But where the real fun came in was actually playing online. So at the moment you can see uh, we're buying different stuff from shops. Apart from shops there's also a hospital which you can visit where you can get yourself powered up. So here we are in the cave section anyway, and um, as you can see graphically it's very very nice, but it does look a bit lonely, you know just walking around on your own, which is a great shame really. I really wanted to show you the actual uh, multiplayer version of the game, but uh, unfortunately I can't because uh, I haven't got my broadband uh, connection set up on my Dreamcast, and to be honest I just don't really have the time to set it up, unfortunately. So as I said before, there are four worlds to choose from, which uh, each world only becomes available after you complete the world before it. So this is the cave section, which is actually the second world. It is actually possible to uh, actually walk around and play the game while you're still choosing your options, since the actual movements are controlled by the analog stick, and the actual menu uh, commands are controlled by the digital part of the pad. Which is actually very, very handy. Also, uh, the game does support keyboards for uh, typing messages, but if you don't have a keyboard, you can use the uh, built in uh, software keyboard, which is a bit slow, but um, better than nothing, I suppose. Also, there is a uh, basic um, phrases built into the game, so it doesn't matter what uh, language you speak, well, as long as you speak one of the main languages in the game, which is uh, English, French, German, Japanese, I think, and uh, maybe one other. Well, it doesn't matter if you speak any of those languages, you can actually place someone in a different country and a message will come up in their language. So basically, uh, say for example, hello. If you pick the hello message, it'll come up in English on yours if you play in English. But anyone playing the game in Japanese will actually come up as saying uh, konnichiwa in Japanese. So it was actually possible to communicate. That's when you have your normal character, which you of course build up and so on. You can also... Um, Buy yourself little uh, mags or eight urn mags. These are little robots which uh, follow you around and actually act as uh, special smart bombs at some point of the game once they're charged up enough. And there were actually quite a few uh, special edition mags, such as um, Sega consoles you could get. So you could actually have a little Sega sound following you around. Apart from uh, standard weapons as well, they also had lots of really good cheap weapons, such as big frying pans, comical hammers, and some very, very nice. Uh, explosions and stuff as well. Fantasy Star Line version 2 does actually differ quite a bit from the original game in the fact that you do actually have new lobbies where you can meet the people and chat and also it does uh, feature some very very nice exclusive battle scenes where you actually team up with your teammates and go on a quest. Unfortunately you can't see them here at the moment because uh, they're only available on online mode which is a great shame. Maybe someday in the future I will be able to bring it to you. But as it stands, Fantasy Star Online version 2 is one of the best Dreamcast games ever made and probably one of the best games of the generation. Yep, it's Sailor Moon. 
for the Sega Game Gear. By the way, how'd you like my Game Gear screen? Not bad, eh? There you go, there's the highlights of the game there, the little bit of speech. As with all games based on the, the Sailor Moon license, I think they're all aimed towards little girls or complete and utter otakus or maniacs. There has, there has yet to be a Sailor Moon game that's actually worth playing. Well actually the ones on the Super Famicom, the walk along beat em up ones that is, aren't too bad, but then again they're not exactly great games either. I think there's also a Mega Drive uh, walk along beat em up which is basically the same as the Super Famicom games. But saying that, you would never actually go and buy these games. So yeah, as you can see, uh, Sailor Moon on the Game Gear is a walk-along platformer. Um, yeah, graphically it does look quite nice, but the problem is that the controls are a bit lacking. Sometimes they can be a little bit unresponsive and seem a bit sluggish, which is really uh, not what you want in a platformer game or any game from to mention it. Levels don't very much, uh, basically this is all you do through the entire game, is walk around from one place to the next. Um, avoid the obstacles and uh, kick uh, whatever enemy comes in your path in the face. Not exactly the worst Game Gear game out there, but um, not exactly one that you'd uh, spend your hard day in cash on. Unless you're, like I said before, after a complete collection of Game Gear games. So Retro Core's uh, going to give um, Sailor Moon on the Game Gear a score of 5 out of 10. Welcome to the Sega Saturn Top 10 and kicking it off at Street Fighter Z02 Dash. Yep, Street Fighter Z02 Dash is basically the same as the original Street Fighter 2 Zero, but features all sorts of little extras, such as um, continuous uh, special moves and so on. Petrocore ranks this as the 10th best fighter for the Sega Saturn. Okay, RPG time. This is Magic Knight Rayath, one of the very first uh, RPGs to be released for the Sega Saturn, and in fact, uh, actually one of the very last games to be released in the States for the Sega Saturn. How the hell they worked that one out, I don't know. But there you go, featuring all the original voice cast of the uh, animation series. And some lovely uh, cutscenes as well, as you can see right now. And in at number 8 is Knights. Those people who doubted the Saturn's 3D powers and have never actually played the Saturn, just take a look at this. Yep, yeah, Knights slightly overrated, I think, but still a very, very, very good Sega Saturn game. Makes it to this week's number 8. And in at number 7 is Elevator Action Returns, the remake of the original classic. An amazing Saturn shooter that everyone should have. May not look much, but it's as addictive as hell. Drop your grenades down, blow the shit out of people with your bloody uh, bazookas and so on. Nothing more satisfying than blowing the dog's head off as well. Probably all the dog lovers hate me now. And here we go, Dead Alive at number 6. Yeah, another game that shows the Saturn can do capable 3D. Look at that, absolutely fluid 60 frames a second, or 30 frames a second on this video. Wonderful high-res textures. Some people might be wondering why I've chosen this instead of Virtua Fighter 2. Well, basically, I think this one looks better, and uh, I personally prefer the way this plays. It's more easy to get to grips with. And at number 5 is Exhumed. Using the, an earlier engine, so what a Quake does on the uh, Sega, Sega Saturn, 
This was made by Lobotomy Software in the States, and it's absolutely fantastic. Just goes to show you that the Saturn is capable of doing some pretty amazing 3D stuff. So the people who made Doom on the Saturn, I'm looking at you, Rare, or Rage. You should seriously get your asses kicked for such a shite job. This is amazing. And of course, we're going to have a Panzer Dragoon title in there. And it's at number four. This is Panzer Dragoon's way. Absolutely beautiful game. Just look at those water effects. First, I prefer this to the third one because the uh, third one is is a good game, but um, I think it's a bit drawn out. Personally, I prefer the uh, shooter versions of Panzer Dragoon without the RPG elements thrown in. Okay, now the Saturn's got absolutely hundreds of uh, shooters on it. So people are probably wondering why I've chose Layer Selection as number three. Well, to be honest, Layer Selection is the shooter that took up more time of my personal life than any other shooter on the Sega Saturn. It's rock solid, it looks beautiful, and for such an early game, it's amazing technically. Play in uh, Tate modes or Yoko modes, which you can see right now. Great soundtrack as well. Sega and at number two is Sega Rally Championship. Still plays and looks amazing even to this day. And the best thing is, it's dead cheap. So every Saturn owner, you got no excuse to not own this game. And that number one is Daytona USA. Now, this just about got in there, just ahead of uh, Sega Rally. It was a close call, but I looked at the past and uh, decided that uh, Daytona should be number one because I actually took. I used to play this a lot more than I did Sega Rally, and yeah, it does look shit. And yeah, there are uh, better looking Saturn, uh, Saturn games out there. In fact, the uh, remake of uh, Daytona, Daytona Circuit Edition, the Japanese version that is, does look a lot better than this, but it just doesn't play as good. This very first version of Daytona for the Sega Saturn does play like a dream. Absolutely amazing. Plays just like the arcade. AM2 certainly managed to squeeze the controls from the arcade machine onto the Sega Saturn joypad and did a wonderful job. One of the most addictive races ever. Unfortunately, the PAL version looks like you're playing on bloody widescreen. Even this Japanese version, as you can see, has uh, got borders. Yeah, again, Daytona USA is actually one of the Sega Saturn's cheapest games out there. So again, there's no excuse for not owning it. Just try and get past all the fanboys' views that uh, Bit Racer was a hell of a lot better than this because it looked better. Well, Bit Racer is a good game, and it was uh, basically the direct uh, competition to this for the PlayStation. But as far as depth goes and uh, keeping you playing for lengths of time, nothing beats Data Owner. So there, I hope you enjoyed uh, the Sega Saturn Top 10. I gotta admit that it's a lot better than the uh, Super Famicom Top 10, which I did. I didn't really think about that one, did I? We saw this last time on the PC Engine, here it is on the Game Boy, this is Parodius. So just how well does this game look on the Game Boy? Well surprisingly pretty good, you got the choice of uh, 4 ships there, being Vic Viper, the uh, Octopus, uh, Twin B and um, the Penguin. So as you can hear it sounds pretty close to the original, as far as Game Boy goes that is. The graphics seem to be well represented in the Game Boy's glorious uh, monochrome style. And as you can see, it does actually look quite frantic as well for the Game Boy game. 
fact, Proteus on the Game Boy is actually very, very good. It's very faithful to the original arcade version. And in fact, it's probably, well, I think it is the only uh, portable version of the game available. I must say they've done a very, very good job. Of course, there are a lot of things missing, such as animation, um, various different bits of detail and uh, so on. But as a whole, the whole game is there. Look, you can get the little cat boss coming up in a second with um, the ship attached to its body. Now the only problem I do have with this game is the fact that the original Game Boy screen is a load of shit and it blurs like hell. If you play this on a Game Boy SP it's not too bad, but um, playing it on a normal Game Boy is bloody terrible because you can't see the bullets half the time. Even if they are absolutely massive. Of course there's no speech in the game, but um, that doesn't really matter too much. And your bombs and uh, your actual fire are actually uh, assigned to the same key, while the other key is used to um, select what power up you want. Or you can just stick it on automatic and just use uh, one button to play the entire game. Which is probably the easiest way to do it, to be honest. The levels do seem to differ a little bit from the original uh, Proteus as well. Such as the level we just saw then, with the exploding crystals, wasn't on the original Proteus, or not as far, not as, far as I remember anyway. So Rich is very happy to get Proteus on the Game Boy. I wonder if a score of 8 out of 10. Absolutely lovely uh, little shooter for your little handheld machine. Can't go wrong. Shish HQ here, shite of the month. Now it's quite unusual because usually we're always pressing the uh, shop X68000. But not this month. Just wait till you see this, it's fucking awful. So as you can see we've got the standard uh, selection of options there. So you can actually choose uh, which round you want to start on as well. So you can cheat your ass off and go straight to the end of the game. But just wait till you see the game. Well presentation so far is pretty good. You've got a decent enough uh, rendition of the soundtrack. In fact it's pretty good. It's actually quite close to the original. you got a little bit of speech there. Which to be honest is pretty low. You can hardly hear it. But then again, the attract, the attract screens are there pretty much the same as the arcade. But just wait to see the game. Yep, that's right. This is the Sharp X68000, and it does look a sack of shit. What you can't actually see on this uh, video, though, is the how blocky everything looks because the camera's uh, filters take away most of the blockiness but that truck that's just come up there in this blue car they look as blocky as hell, fucking awful and I've seen better uh, perspective on a flipping Mega Drive sh racing game that's just disgusting that is and going why is the bridge getting there, uh, the tunnel getting uh, slower the closer it gets So oh, there you have it, this month's shot of the month, surprisingly on the shop.
Now that's a nice intro. Well on Thunder 2, let the Sega Mega Drive. But before we kick off the game, you just gotta check out this um, music screen, or sound system, should say. Isn't that nice? Nice funky little band members there. Okay, so starting off the game here, we've got a choice of two characters. We've got the male and the female. And before every single round, you get these uh, little cutscenes with a nice little picture there. And here we are into the game. So as you can see, Rolling Thunder 2 on the Mega Drive is a walk-along shooter. Now while it does look pretty basic, and uh, you've only got the options of actually uh, jumping up, jumping down, walking left and right, and shooting, you got no specials and stuff like that, but um, it is actually highly addictive. They always say the most basic ones are the most fun ones, and Bonnet Thunder 2 just goes to prove that. There are certain doors which you can walk into which get you some uh, new weapons, such as um, submachine guns and uh, even flamethrowers as well, which you'll see later on. But you do have to be very careful with how you use uh, your weapons. Because even the normal standard shotgun, which you get, which you get as default, has a limited amount of bullets. So once you run out of bullets, you're in shit street basically. So uh, you know you can't just go around blasting the shit out of everyone in sight. You do actually have to take your time. Out of those little uh, cutscenes there, when you uh, finish a level. See we're playing as the guy here. Both characters are basically the same, the man and the woman. Not much difference between the two of them. In fact, there isn't any difference between the two of them. I think they're both identical. But you know, you got to play as the woman, haven't you? You know, just see that best skirt there. Can't help but think uh, that uh, maybe Taito maybe uh, ripped this off a little bit when they were making uh, Elevator Action Returns. But then again, that was based on Elevator Action, wasn't it? But then again, was Elevator Action based on the original Roll of Thunder? Who knows? I should, I should do since I'm reviewing it, but uh, I don't. One nice feature which I do like about the game is where you can hide in alcoves, such as you'll see here, but I'll get killed straight away. So there you have it, it's Roland Thunder 2 for the Sega Mega Drive, and uh, Edgecore is very happy to give Roland Thunder 2 on the Mega Drive a wonderful score of 8 out of 10. One of the better Mega Drive games out there, I have to say a big thank you to Namco for making it. Better known as Fatal Fury Special in the West, Garon Densetsu Special here for the Super Famicom. And just look how many bloody characters there are to choose from. Bloody all of them! And even Leo from Art of Fighting's in there. It's actually a hidden character, so you can't see him at the moment. You can actually get him up by doing a cheap, but you know, we don't see here on Retro Car. So let's start off with Terry Bogart vs. Mai. I 
the first thing you probably notice is the bloody audio on it's weird. Yeah, the whole game does have this weird sort of echo effect to it, which makes uh, most of the music on the game sound like shit. And even the voices on it sound a bit weird because of the uh, echo and sound on it. I must give it to Takara though, they really have put a lot of detail into this conversion of Fatal Fury Special. As you can see, it's, um, they've even included all the different uh, coloured backgrounds. So we just a minute ago, we were playing in the uh, daytime, now we're playing in the early evening. And later on we'll be playing at night, here we go, we're uh, playing at night now. So, as you can see, Takara have really uh, pulled their fingers out of their ass when they made this one. So graphically it's very nice, you even got lots of animation in the background such as the flags moving there and uh, in Duck King's level which we're going to see in a minute, even all the crowd dances about makes the Mega CD version look pathetic to be honest. See, not too bad for the Super Famicom, is it? Pretty good. And just like the Neo Geo version, the characters do actually scale as you move in and out of the background. Only ever so slightly though, but they do actually scale. Unlike the uh, other versions of this game where they just uh, use the same sprites. Doesn't scale at all. Um, after playing um, the Neo Geo versions and the Sega Saturn versions of Fatal Fury, I do find this one pretty difficult to get the moves out on. I remember back in the day when it was new, I used to be able to do the moves without any problems. So, um, I don't know, I'd say if you're new to the uh, series, you'll probably find it pretty good, but um, after playing the uh, Big Brother versions of this game, I, I do find this one quite hard to get the moves out sometimes, especially some of the specials. But then again, it's just a matter of getting back into the timing of it, I guess. So coming up in a minute, we've got a Juby stage, and just wait till you hear the audio on that. Absolutely amazing. Got loads of great uh, speech samples, so I'll shut up when that bit comes on. Excellent. So as far as uh, beat mobs go in the Super Famicom, I'm going to uh, give a uh, Fatal Fury Special a very good score of out of 10. It's kind of really done a good job uh, audio wise of sort of remixed the sound, but you know, it's not too bad then. It is a surround sound if you've got a surround sound setup. Graphically it's a masterpiece, definitely the best looking uh, one-on-one -on -one beat mob for the Super Famicom. And it's absolutely got shit, it's absolutely got shit loads of characters as well. Plus don't forget videos in there from our fighting as a hidden character. Excellent game. What you're watching is a beta version of Shenmue for the Sega Dreamcast. 
footage you're watching now was actually made in 1998, a whole year before the game was actually released in Japan. And actually this uh, footage is taken from uh, Shenmue 1, which is actually in production after Shenmue 2. So we'll be featuring a bit of Shenmue 2 on uh, next month's Retro Core. But um, for now you can see the amount of stuff which was actually taken out of Shenmue. It's amazing how much was taken away from it. So as you can see here, this is a deal that's actually going to drive a bike, or ride a bike I should say, completely taken out of the final game. The reason it was taken out were probably due to the fact that it might be might have been a bit awkward to a programmer to get down little uh, alleys or whatever. But that's just my idea. To be honest, I have no idea why I was taken out of the game. It's a shame, really, because it does look quite good. The lady was just saying that the uh, bikes are actually not on any rails, so it's pretty much like reality. You can go whatever you want. And you can do a uh, different speed, so you can actually uh, pedal slowly or actually go for a bit of a sprint. According to the woman, it looks like it's quite comfortable. Well, there might be Space Harrier in the arcade, like the final game, but also look to the next Space Harrier. What do you see? That's right, Afterburner. And Afterburner was never actually in uh, Shenmue 1. Also in the URK is a fruit machine, which was also not available in the final game. In fact, in its place was a jukebox. Here you can see some of the special weather effects. Just look at the quality of that rain, even as the reflections or the splashes on the floor. The lady was just explaining that it does have a bit of an, uh, an old uh, image to uh, the city and that there's lots of buildings and so on. Good advice there, Leo. Don't play in the road. While there's nothing unusual about Coke machines being in the final game, uh, the Coke machines in the uh, beta version actually had the uh, textures from the cans which were available at the time of this game's production. In the final game, the textures were changed to the old style cans, which is when the game was meant to be placed. Also, you couldn't look at the can in the uh, final game either. Oh, 
Music Game Boy Anime Melody Edition. I'm sure you all know Popper Music from uh, the Dreamcast, the PlayStation, and of course the arcade. Well, here we go with the Game Boy version. And how well does a music game actually turn out on a Game Boy? Well, sitting the Game Boy Color doesn't exactly have the best uh, audio uh, sound chip out there. This doesn't sound too bad. So, being the anime version, you can hear we've got the Sailor Moon theme right now. Now, for those who don't know what uh, proper music is, basically it's a music game by Konami, where you have to press um, different uh, buttons on the uh, joypad or on other versions such as PlayStation, the Arcade or Dreamcast, the actual uh, proper music uh, control board. So basically when uh, the little balls drop down to that yellow line at the bottom of the screen, you have to hit the corresponding button. Hit it the right time or a similar time depending on uh, how good you are, you get uh, a different rating. So as you see at the moment I'm getting absolutely perfect, so we get fever. There's a uh, fever, good, great and uh, bad. Bad of course, where you completely miss it. Just had the Dragon Ball tune, and there uh, we got another Dragon Ball tune here. Actually, the game can be very awkward to control sometimes using the, the Game Boy's uh, controller, or the Game Boy's buttons, I should say, because um, the way they're spaced out is not very uh, well designed for this game. So actually playing the 5 button version of a uh, pop music on the uh, Game Boy is very difficult. So you've got different modes of play anyway, you've got arcade, survival, uh, you've got some bonuses as well. And we've also got a challenge mode. But um, what is very useful is the tutorial mode. Which shows you just how to play it. But anyway, uh, we're going to give a pop and music anime collection on the Game Boy Color. A nice score of uh, 7 out of 10. Not a bad little game if you can get it cheap enough. 